Welcome to Keepers of the Word. We are an esoteric study group of Freemason whose purpose is of sharing knowledge of mystery schools and debunking misconceptions about Freemasonry. You're here with Mike and Ron. Any of the opinions expressed on Keepers of the Word do not reflect the opinions of other organizations or Masonic lodges. We need to state that. Um, so today's topic, King Solomon. King Solomon the Wise. Um, and then later on, we'll jump into brotherhood and how that correlates with everything along with masonry. So, um, King Solomon, man, from his early days, uh, he wasn't the first born. He was actually, I think, third in line or fourth in line. Um, but I believe one of his brothers tried to take, as King David was dying, one of his brothers tried to take place and appoint himself. Uh, David found out and... He said, no, uh, I choose Solomon. And because of that, it created a huge rift. Um, and, you know, I think Solomon was 15 at the time when, when he became king. Hmm. So from there, he, you know, as a child growing up to be a man, he, he had to solidify his place and he had to do ruthless things to to ensure his, you know, his state at the throne. Um, from there, we know of him asking God for something. What was that, Ron? Um, he asked God for wisdom. Why? Why would he do that? You could ask them for anything. Why, why wisdom? Guess that's a hundred thousand dollar question, right? Well, no, I mean, if, if you really think about that, uh, he could ask for riches. He could ask for anything, but he asked for wisdom, wisdom to rule his kingdom. And I think that's, that was the, the perfect, uh, perfect thing to ask for because, with wisdom came riches. And at that time, he was the, the Warren Buffett of that time. He was the richest man, you know, at, at that time. Well, and, and as we've learned that there was a lot of, there was a lot of wars that was going on during David's time. And David wanted, King David wanted to build the temple, but was unable to because he was busy with all the wars and that he was dealing with. So, um, Wisdom was probably a good thing to be able to come out of a very tumultuous time of, of what was going on in the lands and trying to unify the peoples and make peace amongst the surrounding communities and be able to build the temple. I think uh, in, in building the temple, and that's associated to Freemasonry, um, Learning about Solomon in Freemasonry, uh, you, you understand that he is the wise one. Um, as the master of the lodge, you you run the whole lodge and you ask for Solomon's wisdom in order to do so. Um, I think that's that's key with with us as brothers that, that we have to look to the east, right? Why are we looking to the east? We're looking for wisdom, um, amongst other things. But I think as as the the mystery of solomon and i say mystery because there's three different there's three or four different versions and he's me he's mentioned in several different religions not just christianity he's he's mentioned in the the, the talmud the quran um thousand arabian nights uh zoroastrian um and other faiths i, I believe so what does that tell me that, that tells me that this guy was was a well-rounded person enough to have other faiths say, hey, this, this guy was an important guy. He was definitely a figure that everyone seemed to be looking at. I mean, definitely people wanted to be connected with Solomon. They wanted to have a part of what he was doing and a part of, of the empire he was, was building or whatever was going on in his lands. People definitely wanted to be connected with Solomon. So if we look at, at the Christian, uh, biblical Solomon, it's the clean version. Um, you know, it's, it's talks about his, in his books in Ecclesiastes. I'm sorry. I can't say that word right. Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. Uh, the songs of Solomon, book of wisdom, um, where there the is Psalms. A, Psalms. Uh, there's a lot of great passages that, that we could read. Or, or listen to and take something from. But when you go into 
other books, it shows him in a completely different light. Whereas we're talking as of Solomon, the mage, right? We're talking of, you know, him understanding and working with, uh, dark forces and light forces. Uh, how did he acquire this wisdom? It must've been given from God, right? God gave him this, this wisdom and it's talk. They, they talk about a, a ring, a magic ring, uh, which carried the seal of Solomon, which is a signet signet ring that belonged to uh, King Solomon of Israel. Uh, the ring was made from brass and iron, and the two parts were used to seal written commands to command good and evil spirits, respectively. Um, when we think about Solomon the Mage, we think about the greater key and the lesser key, and Goetia, you know, the... the the control of demonic forces to do your bidding. Um, I believe it was Ed Taylor who got me, who got me into delving down that path because he was, he told me as I was going through my degrees, he was like, yeah, Solomon was controlling these outer worldly beings to do his bidding and help build the temple. Um, the jinn, the jinn, um, and and of, of course angels. You had both. He had both sides. So how did he? How did he do that? And if we look at you know the the lesser key and the greater key, it gives you somewhat of a path of how to do it. But the truth is, um, I mean, I don't know of anybody who has summoned summoned anything like that or that powerful. Um, but hey, I, you know, there, there's probably people out there who have. I'm not going to say, you know, I'm not going to dismiss that. Um, going into, going into what Polk Runyon was talking about um, was really interesting because he found that as you were, as you were controlling these 72 demons, you had to invoke the opposing angel. So you have to invoke the angel in order to evoke the demon and control him. So, with many magic practitioners, uh, a lot of the things that they that I've heard over and over again is you must ground and protect yourself first, and I think that goes into the whole part of uh, understanding your mind and knowing Psyche. where you're at. Yeah. So I, I believe we were having a conversation earlier about that. You want to expand on that? Um, you know, I know that um, I know that Lon discussed the concepts of, of your holy guardian angel and, and the, the work that, um, that Crowley was doing, which has some Goetia, Goetic type of, of magic, um, concerned. And, and, and I think that, that, I don't know if it was him or, or someone else that I had heard mention that when you start dealing with magic, um, it's a really good idea to um, be involved with psychoanalysis, you know, see a psychotherapist. And and because you're going to be dealing with recesses of your mind that, you know, for some people could drive them crazy. And, you know, maybe that's where the angels and the demons lie. The angels and demons lie within our mind and and the and magic is just a matter of... of you know, self hypnosis and controlling the mind and creating, creating the world based on what we're able to do within our mind. I think I think that's that's very uh, interesting that you that you stated that earlier because um, understanding you know people who want to get into deep spirituality and looking towards the magic the the magic practice practice uh, of magic side. Uh, you have to understand that you're, you're messing with things that are that could be very powerful, could be detrimental to your health, uh, and again, mess with your mind. How do you know that it's just not you talking in your head, or you, know, or you start hearing other voices? Are you schizophrenic? You know, we don't know. How, you know, but the thing is, is how how do you correlate the two? How do you understand the two? Uh, more importantly, what is your goal? You know, if you're going to go down this path. Um, and I've heard from many people, the first thing they want to do is learn this, this part of magic, Goetia, and understanding on how to uh, control these demons. But 
if you're doing it for selfish reasons or selfish purpose, you can't really get a great outcome out of that. Yeah, you're going to get yourself in trouble, it's, I think. You're going to burn yourself yeah. at some point. And I think that's where, you know, I, I think Polk is is right. Um, you, you do need, need to understand both sides, the light and the dark, in order to really do it right. And from my opinion, Polk really does, you know, it, it makes sense what he's talking about. It makes sense uh, from just a common aspect of, of what the science of magic may be you know you have to understand both sides in order for it to work right um i think as solomon um gained his wisdom and started using his magic uh he started building the house the 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 temple of solomon right um and as as we know the in in masonry that there was no sound of axe or hammer in that house. Everything was cut, laid outside, and when it was brought in, it was just put in place. Now, that's some heavy engineering. If, if that was done that way, that's some serious engineering for that time in order you know, to get things done. Now, who had that knowledge? Who knew how to do all that? I mean, that, that's something that needs to be passed down, and I don't think that that type of knowledge was really accessible or, or there at that time. So it's possible that it could have been passed down through the the spirits or the demons or the angels that he was talking to. It could have, but I mean, also, I mean, there's more and more, there's more and more places that are starting to show up now. Like you talk about like Gobekli Tempe, Tepe in, um, in Turkey that's over 10,000 years old that is a monolithic structure and you talk about pyramids and you and ancient structures there's a possibility that there was knowledge on how to build massive structures and 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 things like solomon's temple but that the, could have been passed down yeah but could the mat the the structures i mean you don't hear about all the the rest of the structures talked about in that way where there was no sound of axe or hammer within the temple. Um, it's Is it possible that the other temples were built in the same manner? I don't know. I wasn't there. Right. But and, it's, and, it's interesting that that's one of the main things that, that we as Masons are taught. Because, you know, we're builders. We're building from the inside out. You know, and, and you know, that house not made with hands is it's technically the same thing if, if you look at it in, in, in that way. Well, yeah, and, and, you know, considering that there is a very strong possibility that Solomon was an alchemist, then alchemy was as much about an internal transformation and creation as it was a physical outward, you know, as above, so below, as outward so inward you know it was it was spiritual it was it, it was a whole experience and and i've actually even heard some um some people talk about that the songs of solomon are actually alchemical are really alchemical processes if you look at the songs of solomon in the bible there's a way to decipher them as alchemical processes. Interesting. I never looked at it that way. Um, going on to the key to Solomon's key by Lon Milo Duquette, which is a great read. I'm about halfway through that, but this excerpt was really interesting. Is Solomon's story true or do myth and tradition hold the key that unlocks mysteries of human consciousness infinitely more astounding than history? Duquette certainly thinks so. The purpose of Masonry's veneration of Solomon is not to advance an alternative view of history, but to present, however, subtly, the archetype of the future human being. Men and women who truly possess Solomon's key, the power to master our own demons and redirect their destructive energy to build the temple of our own evolving soul. So it's interesting in that book, he's stating that there really isn't any, any history on Solomon. Like if you were to look on anything that regarded Solomon, there's really nothing. David, Solomon. David, Solomon, the temple. The temple there's, there's nothing 
that could really... And one of his major arguments that he has in the book is that during those times, it was documenting taxes was a major thing that occurred, and there is no documentation of taxes for the 188,000 people that were there supposedly building King Solomon's temple. So that alone is is... And At you, least something that makes you go, hmm. Yeah, and you also had, what was it, a total of 900 and some concubines and wives? Uh, that's a lot of women. You know women women talk. So, <laughs> so we, and there's got to be something, and there's nothing. There's nothing to be found. So I thought it was an interesting interesting read. Um, and he does talk about the, the, the different versions of Solomon. Um, it's... it's uh, it's an interesting story and then how it correlates with masonry it it changes here and there um if we're looking at biblical and then going into masonry it it correlates if we're looking at the thousand arabian nights and going into it doesn't doesn't fit because now we're talking about the magician the greatest magus who ever lived and that's something that it's it's yet to be we have books and that's that's great but how how is that how did that come about where where is the original one well another interesting thing to think about is that through my studies it seems that what we refer to as magic um for the ancients it was just it was part of their spirituality you know especially if you talk about if you talk about um, uh, Kabbalah and and Judaism, you know there it, there was a certain mis- mystical element that was immediately just part of the spirituality, the religion. You know, I say religion. I, I really consider it more spirituality. I but do too. They, I, I the more that I study it and the more that I look at it, it it certainly seems that those psychic phenomenon, whether you call it magic or you call it psi or you call it, you know, intuition, whatever it was, it certainly seems that it was just part of their part of their learning, part of their spirituality, part of their religion, whatever. So, you know, I mean, a care, bringing a character like Solomon in even if it was even if Solomon was a a novel you mm-hmm. know if 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 the concept of Solomon was a romantic novel that was created like King Arthur or something to that effect you know um giving King Solomon elements of um of people that were during that time certainly would make him more real and would it take away from the character even if it was a romantic you know novel a story uh, that's lawn lawn mentions that it doesn't it doesn't detract from the power of the story of the it's a pretty elaborate story it is it really is and, and it, it was written in different in several different religions, I mean, it it's pointing to Solomon. I mean, it, even though we can't find any physical, uh, there's things written about him. So whether we want to say it's true or false, I mean, it's here. And right. there's information and there's magic associated to it. So, I mean, make your own assumptions. But uh, I, in my opinion, I believe it was real. Um, in his development, you know, of the King Solomon's temple, which one of the one of the greatest things that he that he ever accomplished, um, creating that temple to house the Holy of Holies, um, and going into the Holy of Holies, that that was that was something else that I learned. Where you know, when somebody walked in there, you weren't on Earth; you were somewhere else. That's why we have the cable toe, and the cable toe held you or held the priests when they walked when they walked in there. And held them good so that way they wouldn't get lost or be go somewhere else. Who knows where that that place took you? 
but you were no longer on this earth when you walked in there. And to have that kind of knowledge to create something like that, where you're communing with God directly, or whether you're communing with Metatron or, you know, one, one of God's angels, that's, that's some serious magic, man. If, 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 if I were to tell you, Hey, I I built something, you know, in my backyard, you want to go in, but I got to put this cable toe on you (laughs) and you're not going to be here. You're going to be somewhere else. You think I'm nuts, right? (laughs) Portal, interdimensional. Yeah. It's, it's insane. But to, to read, I I mean, everything that we read from the Bible to the Quran to, you know, any other holy works, it's it's an interesting view because although today, you know, most folks don't believe in the, the spirituality and, and magic, but it was heavily, heavily used in those times. And I feel like we, we kind of like lost it. Like it, we had this knowledge and yeah. boom, it, it, it got erased. And we, you know, we forgot. Unfortunately, religion plays a huge part in all that. Um, if you think about, say, say you're going into Christianity, the first thing they tell you is not to practice the occult, not to practice magic. In my opinion, I believe it's, it's because of control. I think it's natural for us to want to um, get closer to a higher being in whatever way possible, um, through ritual or however you want to. You wanna, and if you go to a Catholic mass, I mean, that is all ritual. The whole thing is ritual. Yeah. You know, regardless, I mean, I mean, if you're talking about, you know, Jesus and the blood and, and, and the body, that's all ritual, man. That's technically it's magic. magic. It's magic. Know? So if you really want to look at it that yep. way, um, hey, it's that's what it is. And, you know, I don't I don't know how else to put it. And sorry, Christians, but yeah, you, you're practicing a form of magic. Well, I'm sorry. Rit- ritual and an initiatory process, which, you know, for whether you talk about a Masonic initiatory process or you talk about the church initiatory process for the first time or the hundredth time that you've been through it, it absolutely is magic. It absolutely, you know, the, the words that you learn and say and repeat and, and if, if you, if, just like just like what we we're taught when we're growing up that if you just if you just say things without meaning it or or just you know just the empty promises empty mm-hmm. words type of thing it doesn't mean anything but when you have intention and you have focus and you are truly involved in that ritual whether it be a catholic mass or a masonic degree Right, it's magic. It is magic, and there's tra- there's transformation, there's Absolutely. transmutation at that Absolutely. point. So you know that's that's the reality of it. Um, and then you know another interesting thing is that Solomon's Temple, not only was it a supposed physical temple, but from what I've seen is that it was built in a manner that represented a human body. So that it was a representation of our holy temple, our person, of which when you get involved in magic and you deal with with magical processes, you're taught that you need to keep your temple holy. Keep your that temple you, that, clean. That you need to holy. keep it clean, that right. you need to practice kind words and what you put into your temple is important. And, and that's, I mean, that's taught within certain religions and all of that as well. So, um, but that's interesting, you know, to think of, of King Solomon's physical temple as a representation of our, so, of our personal temple. True. And, and going off of, uh, the temple physical or allegorical, I have some excerpts from Manly P. Hall. Okay. Um, true temple, the true temple of Solomon is the universe, the solar men's temple which is slowly being rebuilt in man as the temple of the soul of man. So this comes from the Initiates of of the Flame by Manly P. Hall. Um, 
King Solomon began the building of the temple in the fourth year of his reign on what would be, according to modern calculation, the 21st day of April, and finished in the 11th year of his reign on the 23rd day of October. So that was in the Secret Teachings of All Ages, also by Manly P. Hall. Um, and the, I believe this is the last one. I know people don't want me to read. Uh, the <laughs> Temple of Solomon is our solar universe, which forms the great school of life for our evolving humanity and the broad lines of that history. Past, present, and future is written in the stars, its broad outlines being discernible to anyone of average intelligence. In the microcosmic scheme, the Temple of Solomon is also the body of man, wherein the individualized spirit or ego is evolving, as God is the great universe. Freemasonry and Catholicism by Max Hindel. Um, so there's a lot of allegory there. Uh, if, if we're looking at, if you're looking at masonry, you're talking about yourself as a temple and you're transmuting yourself from the rough ashler to the smooth ashler. Meaning, ashler. yeah, the perfect ashler, right? And, and we're, we're making ourselves, and the true, the true purpose of masonry is to become a better version of yourself. I believe that masonry made me a better person than I was yesterday. And every day I become a better person through, through what I feel is masonry. Although masonry is not a religion, I feel that it, it has a very deep and spiritual meaning to myself and to my brothers. And I believe that, you know, if you think about yourself as King Solomon's temple or King Solomon in general, if you're ever sitting in the East, you have to, you have to, you have to govern your lodge and with governing, um, you have to be wise. And that's, I think a lot of that conflict is within now being a past master. How did you feel when you sat first time in the East? <clears throat> um, I'll say that by the time I was close to being done with my first time in the East, I was finally getting it. <laughs> and that's, that's the unfortunate thing. So, you know, for all you new masters that are coming in, I will uh, say, and I gave recommendation to our current master on the same way, recognize, recognize the ability and your job as master of the lodge to rule and govern over your lodge and understand understand the power that you have um and and i'm not saying that from a perspective of i have power so you know bow down to me type of right. thing but realize that that you have the control of the lodge and people are looking at you to rule and govern over your lodge they're your your brothers are looking at you as the leader of the lodge and as the representation of King Solomon as the wise. So, um, me looking back at when I first began masonry and I and I saw um, the 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 what is it the officers uh, installation of officers. That was the first time I ever saw anything anything in masonry. Um, brother or past master, um, Mike Logan was, was taking his, his, uh, seat in the East again. Um, he's been past master several times. Um, but it seemed to me, I, I have so much respect for Mike. Like he's, he's one of the, one of the, my favorite guys here. Um, I learned so much from him. I believe him sitting in the East and he's probably, and this was being, being his like third or fourth time sitting in the East. Right. He got it. He, he already knew what he needed to do. So he was able to govern his, his lodge accordingly. And to me, it was like, for him, it was, it was effortless and his wisdom was there. I, I believe he was really, really into the wisdom of, of Solomon, even though he probably, he's probably not into all the, the, the magical mumbo jumbo that we're into. But he did, he did do it in a way that stuck out to me and set the bar very, very high. Well, Mike Logan really loves history in general. So he is, he is a total just history nerd and loves to eat <laughs> up everything, you know. So, so us talking about 
King Solomon and and mentioning to I think we mentioned to Mike that we're doing the podcast and and he said oh I'm gonna check it out because he is interested in in being educated and and learning but the thing the thing about Mike was I know that when I talked to Mike Mike pretty much had this concept that he has he set himself a certain goal for the year Mm -hmm. and then it was just a matter of executing the goal so you know plan the work and work the plan as people say so and and mike's gotten that now that he's done it before and and done it again and you know (laughs) i i don't think he'll do it anymore unless it really really came down to it but uh uh, but he's still very busy, you know, and involved yeah, in Eastern Star. Yeah, he's very involved in Eastern Star. He's and, involved in our lodge. And Demolay and he's, he's one of those super masons, man, that, you know, I strive to become. I hope I could be as great as that man one day. I hold him in a very high regard. And we um, got a lot of good guys here that yeah, are we like got, that. Yeah, we have a lot of good guys really here do. to learn from, which is, I think in every lodge and, in, in, you know, in masonry, you have those individuals that stick out. Um, you know, that, that have specific wisdom in certain areas, like Jeff Baker, great guy, super ritual. He knows it backwards and forwards, and he's able to teach you the right way. You know, Paul Gallion, also badass. He could give a lecture, uh, a 30-minute lecture with no problem. Right. That's because he loves the ritual. He loves the work. And I think that's a lot of, that's, if you're going to come into masonry, don't come in just because you want to wear a ring. I mean, there's work that we do. This is a brotherhood. This isn't yeah. just something where you come, you wear a ring, and you say you're a mason, and you go walk around the world. Hey, look at me, I'm a mason. No, there's work. There's a lot of work. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff. That, to become a past master, you have to go through all the chairs. That is a lot of work, a lot of time that you're dedicating to a lodge. How much time did you dedicate, or how long did it take you to become a master of the lodge? You went through all the chairs, right? So that's what five or six chairs. Yeah, I, mean, I didn't. I didn't go through all of them, but I went through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like so probably eight years. You know, I so a jujitsu black belt. <laughs> that's basically that's basically <laughs> what it is. So you're you're a jujitsu black belt, and I'm sorry, I'm using that because it takes that, there's that much work that goes into becoming yeah, a master of the lodge. You don't just walk in there and hey, you know, I'll, I'll think about doing this. No, there, there's a lot of preparation. There's a lot of floor work there's a lot of ritual and i'm sorry i can't get into the ritual but you know there's there's uh well then there's social events and social there's, events and, and clean up at the clean lodge up and, and doing the dishes and, yeah. <laughs> and you know i mean th- this is the reality of masonry yeah. it's not just oh hey you know you're you're you become a mason and you're, you're rich and famous hell no that, that's that's not it at all it's work. It's building these bonds with your brothers yeah. and getting in the dirt, getting dirty, and then building something cool and fun and something that that's, you're going to take with you for the rest of your life. You know, that's the way I feel masonry is, what masonry is to me. It's a very important, big part of my life. So I, I look at, you know, people like yourself and Mike Logan, and, you know, I, to me that's inspiring. I, that's something where, you know, I want to move forward and, you know, as Marshall, you know, will I take a higher seat or, 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 or a closer seat next year? I don't know. You know, I work a lot and I know that it takes a lot of time. And, and if you're going to dedicate yourself to a lodge or you're going to, you know, go through, go through your degrees, just know that, you know, your brothers are counting on you. This is, this is the part where, you need to put in your work. This is what it is. And, you know, do you feel that there's a misconception in that part? Do you feel that there is, there are folks out there that think that they just walk in and not have to put any work and, you know, they go ahead and they go through their degrees and they get, they, they get to wear the square and compass. And I mean, well, I think that's, I think that becomes our responsibility as brothers. I mean, it's our, our, one of our number one jobs is to make masons that that's one of our number one jobs as masons is to make masons so it, it becomes our duty to make sure that we're passing on the knowledge that hey exactly like you said this is work it's not just show up get your degrees 
wear your ring, pay your dues, and never come again. Yeah. Know? So, and and unfortunately, there's plenty of those card carrying masons, those ring wearing masons that the ring bumpers do, do just that. But you know, it's it definitely becomes our responsibility to instill that in the in the candidates that are potential for becoming masons to let them know what it's going to take to become a mason i think true and you know going into the going into and not not talking about ritual but talking about ritual um you're you're being taught these things you're you're being taught the teamwork you know the true loyalty you know real brotherhood Mm -hmm. and i think that's a lot of a, a lot that people who come in cannot comprehend what those things are maybe because you never had it in your life or, or it just never existed or you never ta- you were never taught or, or talked about it but as you come into a lodge the brotherhood is is one of the main things that is presented to you and i'm very fortunate to be at this lodge at la harbor lodge because we have a pretty solid team um, and i say team because we all work together we all get things done whenever there is a work party or, or something needs to be done or somebody needs to step in. We do it with no, no questions asked. All right, let's do it. Let's get it done. Yep. And I think that's, that's, that's awesome. And, and I really appreciate my brothers because they support me and they know they could call me at any time and I will support them. And that is rare in life. I think even outside of masonry, most people don't have that. And that's what this brings to me. That's what it brings me real brother, people I could actually count on for anything, you know, and that doesn't exist nowadays. Nowadays, everybody's just out for themselves or, you know, to me, it's, it's a thing of beauty. It's a, it's a thing that's, that's really, really spiritual and um, dear to my heart because we have, we have many, um, many issues with people trying to come in. You know, we, we, you hear this term, guard the Westgate well. Well, it's true because not anybody could just come in and become a Mason. It's, it, you have to knock, right? And what's the and point of knocking? So what does that mean? What does that mean, knocking? Is you're asking to become a Mason. You're asking to enter the door of the Westgate. Um, it's it's special once you go down that path, once you're initiated into your first degree. Me as marshal, I get to interrogate you, you know, do I let you in or not? I need to know my part very well, and I need to be able to communicate it well enough so that way the candidate understands the seriousness of what you're getting into. Yeah. Um, brotherhood's important to me, and I feel... In this lodge, we have that. We're very strong. We're and fortunate. Yeah, we're, we're very are. fortunate, um, which is great. You know, I, 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 how, how do you feel about? Well, you know, I have, that? I have, I have a friend who is a Mormon, and he asked me what my impressions of masonry were. Um, as Mormons, Mormons are very familiar with masonry, considering that Joseph Smith was a Mason and. And I'm not a Mormon, but from what I understand about Mormonism, there was a lot of uh, a lot of ritual that was brought from Masonry and incorporated some of it into the rituals of of LDS or Mormonism, whatever. I believe it's LDS or Latter Day Saints now. Yeah. But um, so his question to me was, "What was my impression of it?" And I said, "You know, my impression was that it was a family thing. I I grew up as a kid with my dad." Being, um, you know, my dad got raised. My dad went through the chairs really quick and and became master of his lodge. And so my impression of it was that it was it was for the family. You know, it was something that family could do together. And I asked him why, and he said, "Well, he had a friend who whose dad was a mason, and his impression was very different." that he felt like um, when his dad got involved in masonry, he lost his dad because his dad didn't involve the family. His dad went and just used it strictly as, you know, a male place for him alone to go and do it. So 
his friend had a very negative concept of what Freemasonry was because of the way his dad went through it. And, and I said, you know, the unfortunate thing is that men are men and that men can be evil. You know, there's bad men in the church. There's bad men in the Boy Scouts. There's bad men in Masonry. There's, there's bad people. Man is not perfect and man has potential to be flawed. And so I told him that we're no different. We're no different than the church. We're no different than any other organization. There's potential for bad people or people that don't necessarily get the exact concepts of, of the brotherhood, the fraternity and use it for something else, you know, whether it be for self motive or, or to try to further themselves in business or whatever it may be. But truly I told him that's not what, that's not what the craft is about. And exactly like you said earlier, I don't strive to be better than somebody else. I strive better. I strive to be better than the guy I was yesterday. And hopefully tomorrow I'll be a better guy than I was today. And so that's truly at the heart of the brotherhood within this fraternity. And I agree with you a hundred percent. I think that that is the key to being um, happy in masonry is understanding that you're always working on yourself to be a better person. And as the golden rule, just do, do good, do good, get good. That's, that's an excerpt from Jonathan. Um, do good, get good. And it's, it's real. I mean, let's be, let's be real. If you do good, Good comes back to you. If you do bad, well, you'll pay for it sooner or later, sure. whether it's in through your own emotion or somehow, some way, the forces and the powers that be end up catching up with you. And it's just, just the way it is. Um, karma, as some, some call it, right? Um, it's interesting. So at this point, do we want to start taking some questions? Let's see. All right. This will be interesting. All right. Uh, what do you got? Okay, so that's weird. The Tibetan Buddhist book, Lamrim. Have you ever heard of Lamrim? No. <laughs> sorry, no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, I haven't, but I do want to check it out now. I think that's uh, th that's something that you know we probably need to delve into. Uh, what if the temple wasn't on our earth? Hence the the talks uh, about spiritual resurrection. Um. That's an interesting concept, and I think that was that's uh, going into what we were talking about earlier is building the temple within. Um, right. If you look at the universe, and if you look within yourself, you find the universe. If you look without, uh, you find the physical realm. Um, looking inward, you open those things, and you're able to make the change changes nece necessary to become the, the better person or better being, whatever, however you want to put it. Yeah. You want to take a couple? All right, what do we got here? What do you need to do to become a Freemason? Awesome. Interesting. Well, uh, definitely, as, as we were talking before, the knock is uh, the, the, first, the, the first step to wanting to become a Mason is the knock. Um, coming freely of your own free will and accord. Um, be a man of uh, good moral character. and um, 18 in the state of California. Yep. In other states, you, could be, you have to be 21. 21 yeah. um, knocking, that's an interesting topic, right? When you say knock, uh, you are literally going to a lodge and you're knocking on their door. That's what that means. Whether that's calling the secretary or showing up and talking to a Mason. Um, most people that go on our page and ask, I want to be a Freemason. How do I do it? Very simple. Um, find a lodge that's near you, like within driving distance or walking distance, if you can. Um, see when they meet. Look, look at whatever events, activities, or social activities that they have 
and then go introduce yourself. Go mm-hmm. talk to these men. Yep. You know, um, find out if these are guys you want to hang out with. Yeah. I mean, what, I mean, what's what if the you don't point? like them? <laughs> you know, what if you walk in there and you're like, mm, no, uh, I'll go someplace else. And every lodge is different. You know, I, I think that's what makes this this really cool. Every lodge is different. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, that's that's my take on it. Um, so knocking is going to a lodge and asking for admission or asking to to petition. And I think that takes time, too, because you can't just walk up, say, hey, I'm ready to join. Uh, no, if you were to come here and do that, that's not going to happen. You know, you're going to you're going to chill for a while, several months or maybe longer in order to have that door open, because I want to know if. I can trust you, first of all. Second of all, are you a guy that I, that I, you know, I could bring around my family and, right. you know, bring around my brothers, bring you into the fold and trust you? That's very important. And unfortunately, a lot of the folks that are out there asking have some, some issues that you need to deal with within yourself, you know, um, and, a lot of people do look for the wrong reasons. Unfortunately, yep. they're looking for riches and fame. Yep. You know, there's a there's a there are a lot of masons who are who are well off, but they worked hard to get there. Yeah, it wasn't yeah, something nobody, that nobody was just gave given. You know, no, you don't come in and hey, here you go, buddy. <laughs> here's here's your, some here's, here's your a mil- business. Here's your million dollars. <laughs> no, that doesn't work that way. Yeah. There, there's hard work, very hard work. Um, you know, brothers that do business together usually are pretty successful sometimes. And some of the some of the the stories that I've heard, and if you have very smart people in a group, you're gonna you're gonna do something good, you know, and it's also gonna prosper, you know. Yep. It's gonna make you some money. Um let's see, let's let's go on to Kazak listener who uh asked us, which is James Bracero. Yeah, I'm sorry I'm throwing you out there like that, but it is what it is, homie. Does <laughs> Solomon's Key play a role in Freemasonry? Yeah, I'm asking you. <laughs> well, I guess that's uh I guess that's a path that you have. I don't think it's necessarily something that's taught us within within Masonry about Solomon's key, but it absolutely is uh, is something that if you if you delve into those rabbit holes and do your research, um, I, I heard a really good quote from someone years ago. I don't remember, but they told me that if there's anything that you're learning during your ritual, during your degree, that may not make sense or might make you scratch your head or go, hmm, you should definitely do some research on that. Because that's, it's almost like things like that are put in there to make you want to look further and and try to figure out, you know, what's up with whatever it is. Hmm. Uh, So the answer is we don't know. Sorry. Um, we probably have to look into that a little deeper. Um, I think it's very important for us to know as much about Solomon as possible. And although I, you know, although I, I, I study, I don't know everything. And you know, and it, it's great because I get to keep on learning more and more as I go down different paths and different books. And I'm lucky to have people around me that could point me in these directions, um, which to me is very interesting. So here's another question from um, the Esoteric Life podcast. Give them a, give them a follow. Check them out. Um, do Masons meditate? Um, I know I do. As a matter of fact, didn't we go to uh, didn't we go visit who, Anchor Bell Anchor Bell Lodge? Yeah, we had to go visit do. Anchor Bell, and they do a guided meditation during their. Uh during their opening for their their ceremonies and personally i, I thought that was i thought it was awesome awesome i, I think too. i th- you know i had to really like check myself because i was going so deep 
I, I thought I stopped breathing for a minute, and I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to die. <laughs> you know, it was weird. It was, it was like, try not to die, try not to die. <laughs> <laughs> That's how deep we got. And I, I had to, like, stop and think because everything was just so silent and serene. The, the, our guide, and I'm sorry, I can't I, – I don't know his name, which is which hopefully I get later. I don't later. remember either. Uh, he was just great at it, man, and he really, really walked us through it and really took us down – down the path of, of being calm and one with yourself. And I think that's very, very important, not, not just in masonry, just in general. Like you need to understand how to calm yourself, how to breathe, how to, how to think clearly, you know? And I, we got that that day, which was, which was a treat. I thought that was awesome to do. And really was. I would like to implement that at some point, you know? Agreed. Um, so to answer your question, some Masons do and some don't. True. Sure. Yeah, yeah. It's up to you. Yeah. Again, you know, Freemasonry is not a religion. Uh, it's a place where, you know, people from all religions who believe in a, in a, in a higher self or, or higher power, higher power can come together in unity and, you know, do good, do good things in their community, do good things amongst themselves and pass that knowledge down. Um, let's see. What else do we have? Which uh, would you recommend? No, nope. do Solomon's that. Solomon's key. Play let's see, Kazak listener. Since you, you want to, is Solomon just a made-up character that represents Hiram Abiff? Hmm. I don't know. I, I couldn't. I couldn't say yes, and I couldn't say no. Um, the legend of Hiram Abiff. It's. It's something we're taught as Masons. You know, he did not give up the word. Um, people died because of that. People died because he didn't give up the word. And he died knowing that he wasn't going to betray his own brothers. To me, that's solid. That's real brotherhood right there. Yeah, that's, that's an important lesson. I yeah. mean, they, it's also a, the same lesson is taught to the Demolay boys as well through Jacques Demolay and 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 the lesson that of of him going to the stake being burned at the stake because he wasn't going to give up you know they were trying to get information on other templars and what had happened to them and where they had gone but he remained silent because he wasn't going to betray his brothers his brotherhood his his integrity he wasn't going to give up his integrity even when his life was on the line and and Hiram Abiff is a similar story so that's it's a very important lesson when we talk about brotherhood it's 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 that's the ultimate for brotherhood that when you're willing to give up your life for your brothers and not you know sell yourself out that's an important i think lesson. that yeah i think that is a very important lesson um unfortunately i can't confirm or deny it um Matter of fact, we can't really confirm or deny anything that's that's written down. Because, again, it was all written by man, right? It wasn't like God came down and said, here you go, guy. <laughs> they wrote that. All right? Follow it. Unless and, we say and even yeah. And even some of that stuff is questionable, yeah, right? <laughs> like, God. Hmm. Hmm. So do we have any more questions from anyone? We're going to take our last ones and uh, see where we're at. So, any more? Do we have any more? Anything? Masonic ritual and divine energy. Does that help access it? Masonic ritual and divine energy. Well, I was told when we're doing ritual, we are doing something. You're, you're doing it. You're doing something to transmute a human into something better through, through the ritual. Um, if you want to look at the ancient, you know, Egyptian mysteries, that, that's what that was for, to, to bring the neophyte to the adept. Uh, so I, I think in short, yeah. Uh, I can personally say that since I've, I haven't always looked at the ritual that way, but I definitely, within, you know, my more recent years have started viewing the ritual in that aspect. And I think when you do, it can become very powerful. 
definitely transformative, definitely magic, like we talked about before. Involved yeah. In it, so. If you're doing it right, you're changing that person. And to give a good ritual, I think um, going through my degrees, I had I had great people doing doing my degrees. So in my in my opinion, it was it was magical for me. You know, it it really made me look at everything that was going on and how did that apply to myself um that is the magic that's where i started questioning and i started wanting to change and become a better version of myself so yes that i think think that's uh well i think also when you get that connection definitely like there's so many people that i've talked to that like have this connection during one of their three degrees where you know for a lot of guys, it's their first degree, and it's a certain point during their first degree where they just they just have this total connection, and usually it's with someone else, whether it be the master or 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 your senior deacon that's taking you around during your during your ritual. But they get this connection, and it becomes magical for them, and then they have this memory for the rest of their life. It was this great memory that's stuck in their mind and they have this connection to that individual you know i had a sim i had an, a situation with worshipful sean donahue during my first degree um ed taylor's told me that he had a similar connection with me during his first degree so you know and that's part of part of the magic that's part of the magic so i think at this point we're gonna go ahead and uh wrap her up wrap her up i want to Thank you for listening. Um, we're going to put this on our YouTube channel. Please like, subscribe, share, um, and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and so on. Um, we do have our pins for sale still. They're $10, and that's including shipping. So just DM us in Insta on Instagram, and we'll get one out to you. Um, we do have something coming up um, in December. No, no, not December. September. 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 Um, Esotericon. What's that all about? What's that about? So, so that is going to be a convention of vendors, speakers in the esoterics, um, uniting orders, uniting fraternities uh, from Freemasonry to the OTO to uh, Rosicrucians um, and other orders all invited to come down and, you know, share knowledge. Um, any vendors interested in participating, um, DM us. Uh, we're going to have our website up soon uh, so that way we can, you know, sell our tickets. And uh, we look forward to having this event. I think it's going to be pretty awesome. We've got, what, five speakers already locked yes, in? Yes, uh, so. so we have Daniel Alexa, who's a hypnotherapist. We have Lon Milo Duquette. Um, Merrick Hamer, uh, Siren of the Order of Lightning, and hopefully James. I would love James to talk about Enoch. Uh, James Racero, um, KZAC listener, if you want to follow him on Instagram. He loves it when people want to follow him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he's going to hate me for that one. But that's okay, because that's who I am. That's so I want to thank our sponsors and credits. Uh, to see Samson Technologies, uh, Performance G, Auto Body and Collision, um, I want to thank LA Harbor Lodge for letting us use the space to do this and my production team, our production team, Indigo Beehive Creative, uh, for producing this show. And I want to thank every one of our fans for supporting us and helping us grow. I, I think that, you know, this, this is all due to you. We do it for you because we love what we, we love this and we love doing it. We like doing so, it. We appreciate you guys out there. Yeah. We appreciate the questions. We appreciate, you know, every, every, everything you do to support us. And I just want to say thank you very much. This is our episode eight, and we look forward to bringing more. So um, thank you very much, and see you later.